Jesus said that one of the signs of the end times would be that lawlessness would abound. That does not necessarily pertain to human laws, but more particularly to God's laws. Human laws are subject to change anyway, and they are often not in line with God's laws to begin with, especially nowadays. But what are God's laws? Many will say, well, it's the Ten Commandments, and they are summarized by Jesus into two. And others will say, it's the uh, all of the Torah, or they will have a list of 613 uh, mitzvot. Um, again, others will say that's all done away with because it's old covenant. But Jesus said that the following in Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, not Jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. So we better pay attention to what the law says and also try to understand why God has ordained certain things. Today I want to look at um, the law pertaining food. What can and what should, uh, and what can we eat and what shouldn't we eat? Um, scripture gives us a fairly detailed overview of that in Leviticus 11 and uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Now, we're not going to read it today, you can read it for yourself, and maybe it's a bit difficult to, uh, to uh, get a, a clear picture from that, although it's very detailed. Um, but as um, yeah, by way of help, I put together um, this, uh, this diagram where you see the animals uh, as they are listed in uh, Leviticus and in Deuteronomy uh, categorized in four groups, uh, animals in the air, the land and then in the waters and then a separate category for insects. And for each of them there is actually there are very clear rules, one or two um, conditions which determine whether they are good for food or not. And um, so that can be very helpful, so we get into that a bit more uh, in detail. Now it's relevant, especially today, more than, uh, yeah, at least in, uh, in the past uh, history. Um, it's relevant because we are being told now not to eat meat because of its carbon footprint, or at least to eat less meat, but it, it will turn out that they will want us to not eat meat. And we are being pushed to eat uh, bugs, um, insects, and also artificially, uh, artificial food, 3D printed food. And um, we can already see on the horizon that also um, human uh, flesh, human meat will, will be part of um, the diet. And this may sound outrageous, but uh, there's already a website where you can uh, register yourself that your body may can be used for uh, to produce food and there is also a company that um, uses um, human cells to uh, to grow to in the laboratory to grow meat from that that then can be used for consumption so we are definitely going into that uh, direction which of course it's an abomination Moreover, as we speak, already many food products have grounded insects and mealworms in them. Um, and as well, by the way, as residue from, from aborted embryos. So unknowingly, um, we, we may be eating lots of, um, let's say, unclean and even abominable foods already. Often these uh, ingredients are not clearly listed um, on, the, on the package and it's very hard to know. Now the difference between clean and unclean is not something that is known since God gave the law to Moses, as we can read in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It's, it's from way before that. Uh, unclean animals, 
exists since the corruption of all flesh began after the fall of man. And even more after the incursion of the fallen angels. We can read about that in uh, Genesis 7. <clears throat> in verse 2 in there it says, Of every clean beast thou shalt take two to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So this is pre-flood, obviously, and it's the instruction uh, to Noah um, uh, well, the, for the amount of animals of each kind he should take aboard. And so you see there's distinction between clean and unclean animals. And even after the flood, this is also clear. In Genesis 8, in verse 20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. It may be obvious that those animals used for offering to God have to be from the clean animals. Now, it might be or get a bit confusing in the next chapter in Genesis, Genesis 9 and verse 3, because there it says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So, upon first glance, you would think from this that we can eat all animals. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat. However, that's half the verse. It continues and says, even as the green herb. Now, we know that not all herbs are good for food. Many actually are poisonous. So likewise, animals, certain animals are poisonous or bad for us. So it's every moving thing, just as the herbs. Um, now, it's very hard for men to determine which animals are good and which are not, especially in, in biblical times. Uh, and so God has given these clear instructions. And, and these are the things that are put together there in this diagram. Uh, many of which now, in modern times, we begin to understand as we get more understanding about biology and about the genealogy and uh, uh, bacteria and viruses and all these kind of things. Um, and we see actually that there is uh, a lot of wisdom behind the instructions that God has given. Many of these so-called unclean animals were designed by God to clean up the earth's biological garbage, you can say. For example, vultures, they can consume 59 times the amount of botulin than what is necessary to kill a man. And botulin is the neurotoxin that causes botulism. So you can imagine what is inside a, a vulture. And you can also imagine why this is an unclean animal with regards to being suitable for meat for us. Pigs, for example, are also animals that eat about anything. And if pork is not uh, fully cooked, then uh, it's uh, very possible that there is um, a, a trichinella spiralis inside. This is, um, uh, this is trichinella spiralis can harm a person's health uh, and even causes, cause death. Um, so it's, it's important that we, um, we stick to these, uh, these rules, these instructions. We found out also only in recent uh, decades that uh, um, from cows we can um, attract Kreutzfeldt Jakobs. Eh, from, uh, this became clear with the so-called mad cow disease uh, outbreak some decades ago. Uh, which was a whole new way to transmit uh, diseases, which was not known before. So there are many things that we are only finding out now. And of, for sure we can eat many of the animals that are um, mentioned as being unclean. We can eat them and, and not be harmed by it. But uh, God did not ask us to challenge his law. He simply asked us to obey them. But Satan <clears throat> wants to turn this whole world against God, to force us into um, ungodliness, and to make us act not after the likeness of God. 
just as he made Eve eat something she was not supposed to. And it's interesting to see that this first sin, the original sin, had to do with food. It was Satan telling Eve that she could eat something of which God had said that she should not eat. And the fruit itself was not harmful. Eve looked at it and she saw that it was good for meat. The fruit in itself was not harmful, but the disobedience was very harmful. Oftentimes Bible verses are used to defend the consumption of anything. Satan used scripture when he was tempting Jesus. And by the way, also there, food was uh, part of the, uh, of the temptation. Um, so also now, uh, today, when we are being um, deceived into eating things that we shouldn't, and not eating things that, that are good for us, um, even now we see that uh, the enemy will use scripture to, um, to convince us. And many will fall for that because they're not, um, they, they don't know scripture well enough to, um, to uh, uh, refute it. So there's nothing new under the sun. I want to look at some of the, the scriptures and their, their meaning so that when people use this against us that we can, uh, can refute this. First of all, there's Peter's vision that we can read about in Acts uh, 10 verses 9 through 16 of the uh, sheet with clean and unclean uh, food that comes down. And we're not going to read it all now, but um, we talked about it, of course, a while ago in our study of the book of Acts. And <clears throat> often this, uh, this picture is uh, used to defend that we can eat anything. After all, God says to Peter, what God has cleansed, thou call, uh, that call thou not uh, uh, common. So... At first glance, yes, but we, we really misuse the text if we explain it this way. And there are six reasons um, that we can easily get from, from this story. First of all, the subject of Acts 10 is the conversion of Cornelius, a Gentile. It's not about food, it's about people. Food is merely a, a, a metaphor that's being used. So the context is not food. That's one. Uh, secondly, Peter himself, he never concluded that it was about food. In fact, uh, at the beginning, he does not understand the vision at all. He, he, it's clear in the text in verse 17, he does not understand what it means, but certainly he does not um, perceive it as being about food. If unclean foods uh, or meats had been approved, Peter would have known this. He had spent three and a half years with Jesus. And now, in, when this vision comes, it's ten years after Jesus' death, uh, and he doesn't even think of this. This is not in, totally not in his mind. Fourth is that Peter responds to the voice in the vision by saying, Not so, Lord. Right away he says, No. It was absolutely clear to him that... Um, uh, this was absolutely against God's law. This is not what what God would uh, would want him to do. And even after God repeats the command two more times, he does not change his mind. That is not an act of disobedience. On the contrary, he knows the law and he sticks to it. And so it must be something else that God means, but not food. The fifth is that later, in verse 28, Acts 10, Paul himself reveals the meaning of the vision when he says, God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now he understands it's about men, it's about people, it's not about food at all. And the sixth is that nowhere in this passage it says that God has cleansed unclean meats. It says there is clean and unclean food on the sheet, but it doesn't say that God has cleansed these unclean uh, foods. So even if it was about food, that's still uh, not what it says. It's what we assume, usually, because 
God commands Peter to eat it. So we assume that it is now clean, but it doesn't say that. And actually, when you read the whole story, you see that it's not about that at all. The vision was merely an illustration that God used to help Peter understand that salvation was open to all. The words in uh, 1 Timothy 4 are very often quoted, uh, lately especially, in the light of the call not to eat meat but bugs instead. And actually it's rightfully so that this is um, quoted, but it's quoted both, both by um, proponents and opponents. So what about, uh, what is this about? Um, what we see today, this call to not eat uh, meat and to, to eat other things like bugs, um, is certainly fulfillment of the prophecy here. Uh, so let's read what, first what it says there. 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall uh, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So the first part of this, uh, this piece of scripture is clear. Uh, it's a warning against false teachers and their doctrines, which are doctrines of devils, and especially, uh, expressly in the last days. Um, but what follows is vital for understanding the whole meaning. First of all, we should recognize that Paul writes about foods or meats in general. He doesn't speak about clean or unclean specifically. This is not mentioned in the whole uh, uh, section here at, uh, whatsoever. And so that is what we see in reality uh, today. We see that we are encouraged. Um, now we are encouraged. At some point we will be forced not uh, to eat uh, any meat. And by the, the, the World Economic Forum and other globalists. But the concern in this scripture is not just any meat, but it is in particular that which God has specifically created to be received with thanksgiving, as verse 3 says. So these are the foods, the foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving, are the foods listed in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 that are good for meat. So that's the first thing. And then, secondly, it pertains to the people, quote, who believe and know the truth, in verse 3. Who are the people who believe and know the truth? That are Christians. So now it becomes very specific, very specific. And right when you think you understand, then verses 4 and 5 seem to diffuse it again, because they seem to say that we can eat anything as long as we pray over it. And I know people that, uh, that say this. You can eat anything, as long as you pray over it. But that's not what it says, if we read carefully. Yes, it says in verse 4, that every creature is good, and nothing is to be refused. refused. However, it doesn't stop there. It's not the end of the sentence. It's one verse, but in, in the original uh, epistle there were no verses. It continues, um, it says then in verse 5, for, in other words, because it is sanctified by the word of God. Let's stop right there. Let's stop right there. S what does it mean? So every, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused because it is sanctified by the word of God. Sanctified means that it is set apart, set apart for a spirit special purpose, for a specific purpose. The purpose namely, in this case, consumption by human beings. 
How is it set apart? By the word of God. That's what it says. And so we need to turn to the word of God. And then we end up again in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. There it is declared which food is sanctified to be uh, consumed with thanksgiving. So when Paul writes every creature, it doesn't mean any creature. Because it's not every creature, period. It's every creature uh, that um, is sanctified by the word of God. That is set apart for food. And then the last part of verse 5 uh, adds prayer to it. Prayer is added to thank God to bless the food before eating it. After the example of Jesus. It is not the prayer that sanctifies the food. It's the word of God that sanctifies the food, first of all. So, in no me by no means it says that, um, or, or intends to say that prayer turns unclean food into clean. It does not say that. It does not say that. It's already clean food that to which the text narrows down. Uh, the food that is already prepared, sanctified by God for consumption. And there, over this food, you pray. So, to, to, to summarize this uh, part, God has set apart certain foods, sanctified certain foods, for his people to eat. In particular, for his people. In, in, uh, basically, for everyone, of course, but um, yeah, people that uh, do not honor God, uh, that do not... Do not uh, even believe they uh, they will not care about what God's word says about food and so they will eat whatever they like so it's God has set apart certain foods for his people to eat that's the first thing we get here from this and secondly we should not be misled by false teachers who either say a that anything and everything is good to eat because that's not what the text says, and B, who say that biblically approved foods should not be eaten, because that's also not what it says. And these are exactly the two things that we now uh, are faced with in our days. Well, there are quite a few more texts that are sometimes used to defend that we can eat anything. And time does not permit to go into all of them too deep. So I just touched on them. One is from Mark 7, verses 14 through 23. That's where Jesus says that nothing that enters into a man can defile him. Again, what's important is the context. What is he speaking about? He is pointing out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, who criticize the disciples for eating bread, which, by the way, is, is clean, clean food, but uh, they eat it with unwashed hands, while they themselves, the Pharisees, had an unclean heart. That's what's inside of them. And so that is the context uh, in which Jesus um, says what he says. And he points also there to the digestive capacity of the stomach, the cleansing capacity of the stomach. He is in no way declaring unclean foods clean. He doesn't say that at all. It's also simply not the context. So, again, we should not misuse this text to make it say something that it doesn't. Another text, which could be a whole sermon on, on itself, is Romans 14. Again, the context. The context is not clean and unclean foods. The context is eating meat versus uh, uh, vegetarianism. That's, that's what we get from verse 2 there in Romans 14. Paul is simply telling uh, Christians to not just judge their brethren for uh, eating meat or others for eating vegetables only. And he also says that it would be wrong for the veget vegetarians to eat meat if they had doubts, because then it would defile their consciences. For whatever is, of, is not of faith, he says, is sin. Now, in this text, in this chapter, there may be confusion about the word unclean. 
but this is unclean in the English. Uh, in the Greek it says uh, kinos, which means common or ordinary. It's not the word uh, akatharos, uh, which would mean unclean. Akatharos uh, is the same unclean that we find in the uh, Hebrew of the Old Testament, which is also used in the New Testament, but here he means kinos. He says kinos, this is common. Um, he uh, uses the same in 1 Corinthians 8. And uh, that is actually food that has been defiled. It's not necessarily unclean food uh, in, the, in the context of Leviticus or Deuteronomy, but it is food that has been defiled, for example, by offering it to an idol, or because the blood has not been drained, or because the animal died naturally, or was torn by a beast. So it's, it's a different uh, meaning uh, of unclean. It's, it's common and defiled. So none of these texts do away with what God says in Leviticus and Deuteronomy about unclean foods. It is simply not uh, the case. It's not the context of these texts. And so we should not allow the devil to use this against us and to lure us to go against God's law, as he did with Eve. Paul warns the Corinthians, uh, and by extension us, for this in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, where he says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, subtlety so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In a subtle way, um, Satan, the serpent, uh, deceives, and it is very easy to be deceived if you're not acquainted with Scripture. And so it's important that um, you take notice of, of this, um, this message. We should be aware of these verses and understand them correctly. The world is not in line with God at all. And the, and, and actually it gets further out of line with God, if I can put it that way, by the day. And they may say that times change, they may say the climate changes, they may say that genders change, and they may say that our food must change too. Eat bugs, eat creeping insects and worms. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. We know that was a lie. We must stand on God's word. In God there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Amen.